Well, what did you learn about sexual health, like, in elementary or junior high? Um, well, I le remember learning about my period this all the time, like, over and over again. I don't even remember. I do remember, like, obviously talked to you about condoms and stuff. They did the condom on the banana thing. We talked a lot about the functions of how it works, but thinking about it now, like, we never really talked about anything besides heterosexual uh, sexuality. How much do you know about consent, or what do you know about consent? Um, consent is kind of like getting someone's permission, but they have to also be in the right state of mind to be able to give you that permission. They didn't really teach us a lot about consent in sex ed classes. I think you were just expected to know what it was. It's kind of one of those things where they're like, we're going to teach you the functionality. We're not going to tell you about the emotional part. That's like almost like they're expecting your parents to do that, but the parents are expecting the school to do that. So then no one brings up consent. I'm standing in front of the Alberta Legislature, where in 2009, Bill 44 was passed as a partial amendment to Alberta's human rights legislation. When controversial subjects like sex, religion, or sexual orientation are discussed in Alberta classrooms, the bill requires that educators get explicit written permission from students' parents to discuss these topics in the classroom. Parents of children under the age of 18 are allowed to exclude their children from these discussions through a written note. This includes the ability to exclude their children from sexual education lessons in grades 4 to 9 and sexual education modules in the career and life management curriculum in high school. For as long as anybody's known, there's been this, this policy that you inform parents. And I think the theory behind uh, sex education is that those are value-based uh, instruction. The provision that's always been in effect through policy is still in effect now in law in the Education Act, not in the Human Rights Act, so it's not a human rights issue but rather an issue of how you operate schools and how you may let parents know about important things that are happening in their child's education. But in allowing parents to opt their children out of vitally important sexual education sessions, the government is doing both these students and society a great disservice. The World Health Organization emphasizes the important relationship between healthy sexual development and physical and mental health. Considering that parents are the primary educators of their children, if they have not received comprehensive, medically accurate sexual education, or if they haven't updated their knowledge since they were in school, then how can they successfully and accurately educate their children? So what exactly is the program that parents are opting their children out of? Well, sexual education is a medically accurate, comprehensive, and bias-free way for students to develop the knowledge required to make healthy decisions. This includes information regarding consent, contraception, sexual violence prevention, sexual orientation, and healthy body image. Research shows that by age 15, over 25% of male and female adolescents have engaged in vaginal intercourse. We desperately need a new sexual education curriculum. It's really, really important that the sex ed that we give students is medically accurate, evidence-based, LGBT2S inclusive, and consent-based. It is estimated that 35% of sexual assault cases go unreported because it was unclear that a crime had been committed. This illustrates the importance of having sexual education in formal learning environments as it defines what behaviors constitute sexual assault without introducing confusing myths. Consent education is one of the most important parts of sex ed. We cannot teach about sex without teaching about consent. We wouldn't put teenagers in a car without teaching them about the safety features of that vehicle. We shouldn't put them in situations where they have to make decisions about sexual activity and their sexual health without giving them information about safety features either. Research shows that when it comes to sexual assault, victims who had received a comprehensive education felt more in control of their situation and also limit the extent of self-blame. It also increases the reporting of abuse and assault. One thing that we often don't think about when we talk about comprehensive sexual education and the lack of LGBT2S inclusive sex education is the impact on students' mental health. Not only the queer students in the room, but also the students in the room who have a lesbian aunt or two gay dads. Therefore, when parents opt their child out of sexual education, the well-being of the child, especially in regards to their mental health, can be negatively impacted. 
Parents are the primary educators of their children, and as such, they have a huge responsibility when it comes to informing their children about healthy sexual identity and self-esteem. This becomes problematic because oftentimes, children don't feel they are able to approach their parents, and their parents don't have the tools necessary to properly educate their children. And popular culture isn't always the most reliable form of information. <laughs> it doesn't come with any footnotes, there is no peer review, it's not evidence-based. But that's where a lot of us learn about sex for the first time. It's not just about giving students the correct information about their sexual health, but it's also about correcting a lot of myths and assumptions and misinformation that they have picked up from popular culture. If youth have been opted out of formal sexual education, and are not getting it from their parents, they begin to rely on the inaccurate media and pop culture, which through technology is extremely visible and influenced. If youth don't have the information, they will look for it from anywhere willing it provided to them. Research has shown that media is the main source young adults use to form opinions on sex, with 77% of television programs showing sexual content. In Alberta, a startling 53% of LGBTQ students say that they feel unsafe in school. Andre Grace, a professor of Gender and Minority Studies at the University of Alberta, says that content currently provided under sexual education programs focuses almost entirely on heterosexual students. So the self-harm and suicide rate for queer students is much higher than it is for non-queer students. We need to make sure that in our classrooms we are the ones who are defining terms for them. Although the sexual education curriculum mandates that students identify the effects of social influences on sexuality, gender roles, and equity, the terms sexual orientation and gender identity are explicitly omitted. This jeopardizes the ability of the approximately 8% of high school students who are non-heterosexual or questioning to make healthy and informed decisions. While the curriculum, which was last updated in 2002, is currently going through a revision, there is no timeline set for this revision's implementation or completion. There are many problems, but here's what can be done about it. Some American scholars call for a law that will require parents who opt their students out of sexual education programs to take a mandatory 90-minute course on STDs and sexual health, and be given the sexual education materials taught in the classrooms. The idea behind this parental education is that parents, by taking the course, will become woke, realize the value of sexual education, and voluntarily pass this information on to their children. Other experts call for compulsory sexual education training for students in Bachelor of Education programs across the country. Surprisingly, in 1999, only 16% of Bachelor of Ed programs at Canadian universities provided compulsory training in sexual education. At the University of Alberta, an education student can graduate without once having talked about sexual education at the context of their formal training. By increasing educators' knowledge about these topics, parental confidence in teachers' ability to deliver lessons about sexual health would also increase. Both parental trust in the education system and the quality of the sexual education provided to the students would undoubtedly increase. In Edmonton, here's what we can do to address this issue. Form 1B is certainly not a good start to resolving this issue is to ensure that those who are charged with delivering sexual education programs to students are well informed about the importance of sexual education to student development. We call for a mandatory sexual education training for all Bachelor of Education students at Edmonton post-secondary institutions including the University of Alberta and have written letters to education faculties across the city expressing why this training is of vital importance for future educators.